Uh, John and I share some common heritage. We're both born in Holland and uh, immigrated to Canada, and uh, we now live here. So, uh, but we're both scientists. He has a PhD in astronomy from the University of British Columbia. He is now retired as a professor. He taught at Trinity University in BC, just north of us here. And he's written a few books, those two books mentioned there, and they're actually on the table available if you're interested. And so he is now that he's retired, he is the author, and he speaks on creation topics in different places. In fact, he just came back from Brazil a few weeks ago, and before that, the Philippines. So he's still very active in apologetics. And what he's going to talk about is comparing Christianity uh, with naturalism and showing this is not a battle between science and religion. This is a battle between two different worldviews, and John will explain that to us. John? Uh, thank you, Heinz. Uh, thank you for asking me to come here to speak. I'm uh, honored to be here. Uh, greetings from Canada. So this evening I wanted to speak on the uh, War of the Worldviews, we've called it. Christianity versus Naturalism. Now this is often depicted as a battle or a war between science and God. And many people seem to think that in this war, science has pretty well won, and that uh, God is either dead or very ill. So we've read, <coughs> there's a number of books that have been written on this topic lately. Uh, Steve Bruce, God is Dead, Secularization in the West, Christopher Hitchens, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything, Victor Stenger, God and the Folly of Faith, The Incompatibility of Science and Religion, Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, Sam Harris, The End of Faith, Religion, Terror, and the Future of Reason. You may have heard of uh, some of these authors. Uh, some of them are very well-known uh, atheists. <clears throat> They've said with Richard Dawkins, uh, he believes two things. Uh, first, is that God doesn't exist, and secondly, that he hates him. Because if God doesn't exist, uh, why is he so uh, upset uh, at, at Christians and fighting Christianity? Now, did science uh, kill God? If God is dead, uh, how did that happen? Well, physicist Victor Stenger writes, uh, God, the failed hypothesis, how science shows that God does not exist. And in this book, he writes uh, that God didn't design the world, that everything whose origins have been understood so far has arisen by simple natural processes, that no God has given us immortal souls. Everything suggests that our minds are entirely reducible to simple material things. And thirdly, that no God has made any miraculous interventions. So he believes then that this pretty well kills the case for God. Uh, Dawkins um, argues that biology has killed God. In one book he writes, uh, this is the God delusion. When one person suffers from a delusion, it's called insanity. When many people suffer from delusion, it's called religion. <laughs> He's also famous for saying that Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And what he means here, that before Darwin, if you didn't believe in God, then you had to explain, well, how did everything get to be here? Whereas with Darwin, it gave the atheist then a story, if you like, a theory of how everything got here without making the use of God. Uh, Dawkins has also written that faith is belief in spite of the evidence. So he believes there's no evidence for Christianity and that if you believe in God, you are denying the evidence that exists. Now, another English uh, physicist, Stephen Hawking, has written a book called The Grand Design. And in it, he argues that, God, that physics can explain everything, and therefore God is not necessary to create the world. So we can explain it without, without referring to God. 
And he writes, ignorance of nature's ways led people in ancient times to invent gods. And the idea is that now we know better, so we don't have to invent gods anymore. The Dawkins has said that Darwin kicked God out of biology, but physics remained more uncertain. Hawking has now administered the coup de grace. The physicist Victor Stenger, whom I just mentioned, in another book called The New Atheism, Taking a Stand for Science and Reason, he has written, faith is always foolish and leads to many evils. Faith is belief in the absence of supportive evidence. Uh, note again the contradiction that they see between faith, belief on the one hand, and evidence on the other hand. And note that he makes two claims here. First, that to be rational, a belief must be supported by sufficient evidence. And the second claim that he makes is that belief in God is not supported by sufficient evidence. Uh, therefore, belief in God is irrational. So note, uh, how did science kill God? <clears throat> it is claimed in general by these authors, first of all, that science can explain everything. So God is not needed to explain the world. Uh, secondly, that the physical laws leave no room for miracles. So that means that biblical accounts of miracles must be false. And thirdly, that there is no evidence for God, which means that belief in God is irrational and delusional. Now, one thing we can ask here is, uh, what's the case uh, with evidence and faith? First of all, must all beliefs be based on evidence? This whole notion of uh, evidence comes from uh, an English philosopher, Clifford, who wrote in the 1800s, it's always wrong to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. Now, evidence we can think of very broadly as uh, support for a belief by way of some kind of an argument. But the trouble is that uh, you can't support everything you believe by way of an argument because all explanations must eventually come to an end. If your son asks you, uh, why is the sky blue? Then you could try to answer him by uh, explaining some things about physics and uh, <clears throat> wavelengths uh, of certain, uh, light of a certain wavelength bouncing off atoms in the atmosphere and so on. But then he can ask, well, why, why is that the case? And eventually you have to say, well, that's just the way it is. And so it is with explanations. Uh, we all have to accept uh, certain basic beliefs on the basis of uh, assumption. So we all have various foundational beliefs that we accept without evidence. And we'll see that even scientists have these beliefs. So should all beliefs be proven? Well, some things are obvious. For example, if I say I feel hungry, are you going to ask me what's the evidence for that? Well, that's the way I feel, right? I can't, I can't say I have evidence for it. It's just a very basic thing. Or the sky looks blue to me. So we all take what we feel or observe as basic. We're not going to require evidence for that. And other things as well just have to be taken as, as true on assumption without proof. For example, we can't prove that our senses are reliable without first assuming that they are reliable. Uh, we, can't assume, we can't prove that our minds are rational without first assuming it. We can't prove that the laws of logic are valid without using the laws of logic to do that. So you get into a circular argument here that you have to, first of all, prove or assume things before you can prove anything. So my point here is that many basic beliefs must be accepted without evidence. So why could belief in God not be such a very basic thing that is so obvious uh, that we just accept it as such and that we don't need any further proof for it? Furthermore, facts count as evidence for some belief only after we interpret the facts in terms of a worldview. 
And depending upon how you interpret the facts, uh, you're going to have uh, different assessments of what it counts as evidence for. For example, look at the uh, claims made against religion. Okay, I just read a few authors that said that everything can be explained by science without God, that miracles have never happened and can't happen, and that there is no evidence for God. Now, you might ask, uh, what's the evidence for any of these statements that they're true? For example, the first one, uh, everything can be explained by science without resort to God. So we know that's not true because science can't explain a lot of things right now. For example, how did life arise from non-life? Uh, how can minds come from matter and consciousness? And the scientist uh, might argue, well, we don't know yet, but we hope in a few years we'll know that. That might well be the case, but it is, as it stands, it's a statement that's made without sufficient proof. It's based on an assumption. Uh, the same thing for the second statement, whether miracles have happened in the past or can happen, uh, how can you ever prove that? So you, you can't, because even if you could prove that no miracle has happened yet, how can you prove that no miracle will happen tomorrow? That you can't because you have to assume that the laws can't be broken, but you don't really have any evidence for that. Now, similarly to the third one, is there evidence for God? Lots of people claim to have experienced God. So how are you going to counteract that? You would have to say that they're all liars. So my point is that none of these are based on sufficient evidence. These are all statements made by those authors on the basis of their worldview. And this brings us to the question, uh, how objective is science? Because the myth that we hear quite often is that if we have an encounter between science and religion, then it's a question of science being factual, objective, and rational, whereas religion is seen as mythical, subjective, and irrational. And if you view the contest between science and religion in these terms, then science will always win. Nobody wants to be seen, for example, as being irrational. But the reality, however, is that science is not objective. Okay, the reality is that science has both objective and subjective elements. And in science, we have to distinguish between the hard data, okay, the things that we actually observe in the lab, the things that we can test, that we can uh, repeat on the one hand. Okay, these are fairly subjective. Whereas on the other hand, we have to distinguish between theory, okay, explaining the data, which is much more subjective. And the difficulty in science is that if you have a set of data, there's more than one way that you can explain the data. There's more than one theory that may be able to fit the facts. Let me give you one example. If you look at the stars through a telescope, uh, you'll see some beautiful things in the sky. Here's a picture from the Hubble telescope. So these are all galaxies. God has made a wonderful universe. But if you look at these galaxies, uh, if you study them scientifically, you'll find that the light from the galaxies is shifted towards the red. And the further away a galaxy seems to be, the more the light is shifted towards the red. Now, what could explain that fact? Well, one explanation is that uh, space is expanding, so that the galaxies are thought to be embedded in space, and as the universe expands, the galaxies are moving further away from us. The light is being stretched as well, which means that the light rays, the wavelength becomes longer, and the light becomes reddens. That's one possible explanation. But you can also explain it uh, by saying, well, maybe space is not expanding at all, but galaxies are moving through space. That would give you a similar reading effect. 
Or maybe there's a large mass at the other end of the universe that has a strong gravitational attraction on the galaxies that will also cause a redshift. Or maybe the speed of light gets less <coughs> as time goes on. That will give you a redshift as well. This is Dr. Snelling, for example, uh, is one of his theories. Or maybe the universe isn't getting larger, but maybe we're getting smaller. So if you have atoms that are shrinking, that will also give you uh, a redshift uh, with the galaxies. Or well, one last explanation, uh, maybe light just gets tired as it travels. Uh, don't laugh because it makes sense, right? As, lav as light travels through the vacuum, it, it loses, loses energy. Uh, the more energy it loses, the more the light is shifted towards the red. So here we have another explanation. All of these you find in the literature. Uh, the first one is the most popular one. That's Big Bang cosmology. Uh, but the question is, that which one of these is correct? Because if they're all consistent with the data, then how can you tell which theory is the true one and which ones are the false ones? Okay, we like to test theories with data, but if they all fit the data, then you've got a problem. Thank you. So this is the problem in science. And uh, philosopher Carl Hempel has written that transition from data to theory requires creative imagination. <clears throat> he writes, scientific theories are not derived from observed facts, but are invented in order to account for them. So it's precisely here where we get a very large subjective element in science. So again, we have to distinguish between what do we actually see and how are we going to explain what we see. Let me give you another example. Uh, here's a diagram of uh, ancient man. Uh, this is uh, Nebraska man. This was found in textbooks a long time ago, 1922. Uh, note that it says here, uh, artistic reconstruction. And uh, quite often, if you see these pictures uh, of ancient man in science books, uh, you might see artistic reconstruction. And that brings up the thought, of, okay, how much of this is actually scientific? And how much of this is just the artist's imagination? So in this case, uh, we know exactly how much data is behind it. If we look at the data, we find it was just one tooth. <clears throat> Here you have uh, four different views of the tooth. So it seems as if this is uh, mostly uh, imagination. Uh, the difficulty is that even with this one tooth that was found later, that this was actually a pig's tooth, which means the entire diagram here is artistic reconstruction. It's just artistic imagination. None of this is really scientific. So it shows you that you have to be very careful once you move beyond the data. Okay, theories don't fall into your lap. They have to be constructed, and they're constructed according to our prior assumptions as to what the universe should be like. Another philosopher of science, Imre Lakatos, has written, scientific theories are not only equally unprovable and equally improbable, but they are also equally undisprovable. So he says you can never prove a scientific theory to be true because how do you know that tomorrow somebody might not come up with data which is going to show your theories to be, that your theory is wrong. Uh, secondly, he says all theories are equally improbable because in theory you could dream up an infinite number of theories to explain any set of observations. So the chance of one particular theory be, being correct is one out of infinity, which is zero. But then he says, uh, <clears throat> but they're also equally undisprovable. So he says, well, if you really like a theory, then nobody will ever be able to disprove it because you can always um, come up with secondary theories to defend your favorite theory. 
Let me give you an example. Let's suppose I believe that the moon is made of green cheese. How would I test a theory like that? Well, I could send a rocket up, right? Collect a sample. Uh, we could bring the sample down. We could analyze it in the lab. And then we could see whether my theory was correct or not. So we do that. We send a rocket up. It comes back with a piece of cheese. Uh, we bring it into the lab. We examine it. It turns out to be a rock. Now, does that disprove my theory? Well, not necessarily. If, if I have strong grounds for believing that the moon is made of green cheese, and I want to hold on to that, then I could always defend this theory by saying, well, wait a minute. The moon is made of cheese, but it's a special type of cheese that when it has contact with the atmosphere of the Earth, it turns to rock. <laughs> and this is sort of the thing that, that goes on in science, that if, if you want to in science, uh, you can always hold on to a favorite theory. You can always save your theory. The philosopher Will Willard von Ormond Quine has written, any statement can be held true, come what may, if we make drastic enough adjustments elsewhere in the system. Uh, an, exa an example of this might be Big Bang cosmology. Uh, the earliest version of Big Bang cosmology had some problems, uh, the horizon problem and a few other problems that I'm not going to mention. But these were solved by invent inventing a concept called inflation. So that saved Big Bang cosmology. Uh, the difficulty was that inflation made a few predictions. One prediction was that the mass of the universe was much larger than we actually observe. Does that disprove Big Bang cosmology? Well, no, it doesn't, because we can save inflation by postulating that 95% of the mass of the universe is dark matter, which means it's out there, but we can't see it. And if that doesn't work, then later on we invent such a thing called dark energy. And we keep on inventing new concepts uh, whose only purpose is to save Big Bang cosmology. So instead of these observations destroying the theory, it just causes uh, secondary theories to be invented in order to hold on to your favorite theory. Because if you don't believe in Big Bang cosmology, then how are you going to explain from an atheist perspective uh, how everything came to be? So what I want to stress here is that in theories, with scientific theories, there's more than one theory that can explain the same set of data. And the question is, well, which theory should we choose if we have a whole bunch of theories that can explain the same set of data? You might say, take the simplest theory. <clears throat> but then the question comes up, how do you know that a simple theory is more likely to be true than a more complicated theory? You can't be sure that the simplest theory is necessarily the correct theory. Okay, that's an assumption. So we have no certain means of separating true theories from false theories in science. And that means that in practice in science, we choose those theories that fit in best with our worldview, with our prior assumptions about the world. So again, what I want to stress is that only observational data can be accepted as fact. And then in practice, then our theories are influenced by the data, by our creative imagination, but also by our worldview. So this brings us to the question of uh, what do we mean by a worldview? So a worldview is how we answer very basic questions. For example, does God exist? Or what exists? Why does the world exist? What is man? What can we know? What should we do? What can we hope for? Now, if you look at these questions, uh, these are very basic questions. And <clears throat> they're also very tough questions. Uh, these are questions that the philosophers uh, have kept themselves busy with for quite some time. 
And note that the first one has to do with religion, the second one with metaphysics, third one with teleology or purpose, anthropology, epistemology, ethics, eschatology. So this gets us into philosophy. I know that philosophy is not popular with a lot of people. A lot of people, when they think of philosophy, they think of something like this. Uh, next time the philosophy department throws a party, let's go bowling. Okay, philosophy is seen as something which is boring. Right? So philosophers uh, deal with questions that are nitpicking, that are useless, not much fun. But the difficulty is that the basic worldview questions are of a deeply philosophical nature. It requires uh, deep work. You have to think deeply about these questions. Uh, it takes concentrated thoughts. Not only that, but how you answer these worldview questions <coughs> can have uh, very profound consequences. Uh, for example, here's one situation. Um, here's a famous painting of the French Revolution, a case where a change in worldview in France led to very drastic action. So here we see that deeply held ideals uh, can lead to very drastic action. Now look closely at this one because the next picture is going to be very similar to it, but with a few profound uh, differences. So this is the world of the French Revolution. Uh, here we have the same picture, cartoon version. Uh, note, by the way, that we've got uh, Snow White here uh, for liberty. Uh, Mickey Mouse is here as well. We've got uh, the Eiffel Tower. It's got a little flag that has windows on it. Uh, there's a building there that says drink Coca-Cola. <coughs> uh, what kind of a world do we have here? This is a, this is a spoof on uh, the shallowness of modern culture, where people are concerned with gadgets, with uh, superficial fun, but there's no depth here anymore. So one's worldview produces a platform from which to critique other worldviews. So that's why it's important that you have a solid worldview, and that you're aware of your worldview, and that you can use it to address other worldviews. So a worldview consists, first of all, of a set of presuppositions. So your presuppositions would be your assumptions, your basic assumptions, your most basic assumptions about what the world is like. <coughs> so these would be your answers to those worldview questions. But usually a worldview also has a story. It's a framework that holds the whole thing together. So in a Christian worldview, for example, the framework would be the biblical motive of creation, fall, redemption. For the naturalist worldview, the framework would be evolution. Okay, the story of evolution would hold the whole thing together. Now, worldview serves as eyeglasses, <coughs> first of all. So just like when you wear glasses that have, let's say, uh, yellow tinted glasses, uh, it'll make you see the world, uh, everything is yellow that you look at. Similarly, a worldview colors everything you see. And the difficulty with worldviews is what happens when somebody who wears yellow tinted glasses meets somebody who has uh, rose tinted glasses. How are you going to convince that person that the world is not rosy, but is actually yellow? Because one of the difficulties you have with a worldview is that, like glasses, if you wear them long enough, after a while you don't realize you're wearing glasses. And most people, although everybody has a worldview, most people aren't aware that they have a worldview. So in apologetics, your first task 
often is to convince the person you meet so that they do in fact have a worldview, that what they accept as fact is not necessarily so, but uh, what they believe about the world is colored by some initial assumptions that they make, even though they're not aware that they have made those assumptions. A worldview is like eyeglasses. It's also like a map, however. So a map is used to give you direction. Okay, so similarly, a worldview gives you purpose. It helps you to answer questions. And it gives you direction as to where you want to go. Now, a question that may come up is, uh, OK, if a worldview is like wearing different colored glasses, uh, then how can you ever convince somebody that their worldview is wrong? Because wouldn't all worldviews be the same? Well, there are a few criteria that should go across all worldviews. For example, you would think that all worldviews should be consistent, okay, that your basic answers to the worldview questions are not going to be inconsistent, but that the whole thing is going to hang together cohesively. Uh, you would think also that your worldview should be consistent with experience. So if, for example, your worldview says that you don't have any experiences or that your experiences are all illusions, okay, materialism, we'll see shortly, or naturalism, uh, then there should be something wrong with that worldview. <clears throat> because a worldview is supposed to explain what you see. It's not supposed to explain away what you see. Okay, so the basis should also always remain your experiences of life. Those are the things you're trying to explain. Okay, your worldview shouldn't tell you that those experiences are actually illusions. <clears throat> Thirdly, a worldview should be livable. For example, you could have the worldview that language has no meaning or that words can mean anything you want them to mean. So, for example, you have professors that write thick books saying that language can't convey meaning. Well, if that's the case, how do they expect people to read their books? And yet, you'll find such books are being written. If you believe words can mean anything you want them to mean, what do you do when you're sick? And you go to the doctor and he gives you a prescription. Uh, then you want to make sure that when you take a pill, you take one from the right bottle with the right name on it uh, and not the wrong one. So if you have a worldview, a postmodern one, that says uh, language can't convey meaning, words can mean anything you want them to mean, that's a nice one for uh, a, f <clears throat> a professor to have in a study, but you can't live that out in practice. And finally, a worldview should be, okay, a worldview should allow you to explain common sense and science, okay? So these should be consistent with your worldview and not something that you can't explain in terms of it. And we'll see that naturalism has difficulties with these. Let's look at naturalism as a worldview. A good summary of the naturalist worldview can be found in the words of William Provine. He's a naturalist. He's an historian of science. And he's written, evolutionary biology tells us there are no purposeful principles of nature, no gods, no designing forces that are rationally detectable. Second, there are no inherent moral or ethical laws. Third, human beings are marvelously complex machines. Fourth, when we die, we die, that's the end of us. No hope of everlasting life. Free will does not exist. Evolution can't produce a being that is freely, truly free to make choices. The universe cares nothing for us. There is no ultimate meaning for humans. Uh, there, in a nutshell, you have the naturalist worldview. And if we summarize this, uh, the story here is full evolution. Metaphysics is purposeless materialism, only natural causes. <coughs> uh, the knowledge comes from empiricism, just from your senses. There's no place here for divine revelation. 
Anthropology, man is just an accident. He has no soul, no hope for after death. Ethics, there are no absolute norms, and so on. There's a physicist, an English physicist by the name of Roger Penrose, who has written some interesting books. If you're interested in physics uh, at a popular level, I would recommend his books to you. <clears throat> but one of his books, uh, the last chapter has the title, Three Worlds and Three Mysteries. And Penrose argues that so there's actually three worlds that exist. Okay, the first world uh, is the world of matter. So we look around this room and we see uh, people sitting in chairs uh, and so on. But then he says there's also a second world, that's the world of your mind. Okay, that has to do with your thoughts, uh, your beliefs, your desires, and so on. But he says there's also a third world, and that's the world of mathematics. Uh, the world of mathematical equations, mathematical truths, and so on. And the three mysteries are uh, how do these worlds connect with one another? Because Penrose believes that the material world, if you look at it closely, you'll find that there's a lot of mathematical structure. Let me move on to the next slide quickly. Because <clears throat> in the real world, you'll see a lot of interesting mathematical patterns, geometrical patterns. But if you study physics, you find the neat thing about physics is that you can summarize a lot of physics with just a small number of equations. So here we've got six equations. Uh, with these six equations, you can do all of mechanics, electricity and magnetism. All of chemistry is based on that one equation, Schrodinger's equation, supposedly. So it's really neat that the universe is such that with a small number of equations, which are just at the right level that we humans can understand them, uh, that we can do all this science with just these small number of equations. It seems as if the world was designed to be friendly to humans. So Penrose argues that the real world, because uh, <clears throat> what Penrose says is that it looks as if the material world comes from the mathematical world. And he says, the problem with that though is that in the mathematical world there's many possible real worlds. What is it that chose one particular set of mathematical equations uh, and made them concrete? And the problem here is that mathematics is something that's abstract. A material is something that's uh, hard and concrete. So, so how do you take a mathematical equation and make it into something concrete? That's his first mystery. The second mystery he has is uh, how do you ever get minds coming from matter? Because your mind is quite different from matter. So if you believe in evolution and that the mind is something that evolved from matter, Uh, then how do you ever get mind coming from matter? Because matter operates according to the laws of physics and chemistry, about how things are, whereas the mind operates according to the laws of uh, logic, uh, rationality, morality, and those are concerned with how things ought to be. How do you ever get from is to ought? It seems to be impossible. And then a third mystery is that if you have mind, which is something that evolved, um, how is it that the minds can give rise to thoughts of mathematics, which seems to exist outside the mind? So he's got three mysteries here, and he doesn't have a clue as to how to solve them, as to how to get from one world to the other. <clears throat> Most materialists believe that the real world is the material world, and that the other two are illusions. Uh, Penrose is different. He believes the real world is mathematics, and that the material world and the mind are both illusions. Now, from a Christian perspective, uh, it's easy enough, right? Because we believe that God upholds mathematics. Uh, God is truth. The logic refers also to God, God thinking. 
God has made the universe according to a rational plan, and therefore we expect to see mathematical structure. God has created man in his image, and therefore we expect man to be able to discern the structure that God has put there. And from a Christian perspective, the whole thing hangs neatly together. But from a materialist, from a naturalist perspective, uh, it becomes very difficult. Let me move on here. So for naturalism, we've got problems. How do you ever get from math to matter, from matter to mind, from mind to math? And we'll see there's also the difficulty of self-reputation. So looking at math to matter problems, uh, the questions we have here is why does the universe exist? Why does it have order? Why is it mathematically intelligible? Why does it have a particular mathematical form? How are mathematical forms actualized uh, in a physical structure? Or if we look at matter to mind problems, we can ask uh, how can purposeless matter produce purposeful life? How can chance produce complexity? How did information arise? How can matter become conscious? And so on. And here we have a picture of a brain scan. Well, from mind to math, we can ask, why should we trust our minds? How can non-physical absolute exist? How can is produce ought? And so on. Now, Darwin had a horrid thought. He wrote, a horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? And the problem that Darwin was getting at was uh, that evolution is geared towards useful beliefs, but not necessarily true ones. Because if we're looking at survival of the fittest, uh, then everything we do is geared towards survival, but not necessarily towards truth. So if evolution is blind, then why should our beliefs be true? And the evolutionist also has another problem, that if our beliefs are true, why is our belief in God then not true? <clears throat> now, Sir Francis Crick wrote a book called The Astonishing Hypothesis. In this book, he says, the astonishing hypothesis is that you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions are all actually illusions caused by a vast assembly of nerve cells. Now, we find the same thoughts uh, with other materialists as well. Sam Harris writes, free will is an illusion. Our wills are simply not of our own making. And Jerry Coyne writes the same. Free will is an illusion so convincing that people simply refuse to believe that we don't have it. Now the trouble <clears throat> with saying that free will is an illusion, or Francis Crick saying that free will is an illusion caused by your brain neurons, is that if all your beliefs are illusions caused by brain neurons, now what does that say about Crick's belief that all your beliefs are illusions? What he's saying, all, all your beliefs are illusions except for mine. You see, but if what he's saying is true, then he's contradicting himself. And this is the problem with naturalism. Ultimately, it's self-refuting because you have to say that everything is run by matter, that our free will doesn't do anything. And if that's the case, how can you ever convince somebody that naturalism is true? Because then you're assuming that there are minds out there that you're trying to convince. Not only that, but morality is seen to be an illusion as well. Ethics, as we understand it, is an illusion fobbed off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. And so there are no ethical laws. Uh, Everything that works so that you have more children is all that's required. Or, if you don't have free will, why should you punish crime? The philosopher Derek Perabohm has written a book, and he says, given our best scientific theories, namely that we don't have free will, uh, we shouldn't punish uh, severely criminals uh, because they couldn't really help what they did. Therefore, we should be lenient. 
The trouble with that is uh, if criminals can't help what they do, neither can judges, right? Or neither can philosophers. So how can you argue that we should change our minds because we don't have any choice in what we do and we don't have any free will? It's, the whole thing is inconsistent. So it's like this drawing by uh, Escher here. There's a waterfall. The water goes down, down. If you look at any part of it, it makes sense. But if you put the whole thing together, you find you have a contradiction. The water keeps on going down, you'll see, but eventually you're back to where you started from. And the same thing <coughs> goes with naturalism. Arguing that naturalism is true presumes reliable minds, objective truth, purposeful selves, rational norms, mental causation. But all of those things are denied by naturalism. So you can argue that naturalism is true only if naturalism is false. So there are, <coughs> pardon me, there are essential presuppositions for rational discourse and for science. All of these are denied by naturalism, but all of these make sense within a Christian worldview. Why are we here? William Provine writes, there is no ultimate meaning for humans, so he has no reason to exist. Richard Dawkins writes, we are machines built by DNA whose purpose is to make more copies of the same DNA. That's exactly what we are for. It is every living object's sole reason for living. <clears throat> now, this is an interesting statement. Uh, first of all, you can ask Richard Dawkins uh, if his sole purpose for living is to make more copies of DNA of himself. Why is he writing books and giving lectures? He should be at home with his wife. But note also here that recall that Dawkins said that Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. <clears throat> but now he's saying that your only purpose is to make more copies of yourself. So the price for being an intellectually fulfilled atheist is that his intellect becomes a meaningless illusion. Let me move on quickly to the basics of the Christian worldview. <clears throat> the story is creation, fall, redemption. Uh, we see God as the ultimate reality. For knowledge, we believe that in divine revelation, as well as senses, anthropology, man is created in God's image to serve him, body and soul. Absolutes, God sets all the ethical norms. Uh, Hawkins has written in his book, The Grand Design, it's pointless to ask whether a model is real, only whether it agrees with observation. So he says if there are two models that both agree with observation, you cannot say one is more real than another. One can use whichever model is more convenient. This is interesting because Hawking's also say that God is unnecessary. Yet his philosophy of science leaves room for an alternative Christian model. And since Hawking's model has no room for free will, it seems that any alternative seems preferable. So again, he's just undercutting himself, I think, with this statement here. So for naturalism against Christianity, it's important to keep in mind that, <clears throat> let me quote Abraham Kuyper here, he says, it's not faith and science, but we've got two scientific systems here against each other. Two scientific elaborations opposed to each other, each having its own faith. C.S. Lewis has written, there's no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. And Alvin Plantinga has also written that uh, Christians should develop their own science based on their own presuppositions. So it's not Christianity against science. Rather, it's a Christian view of science versus a naturalist view of science that we should be looking at. And what's at stake here underneath is what we can call the antithesis. Okay, the antithesis is the global conflict between faith and unbelief, between Christian and non-Christian worldviews. Science and culture should be either God glorifying or 
God defying. And the main issue is, does the Bible reveal absolute truth or does it not? That is the prime starting point. So it's a question here of uh, God's word versus Satan's deception. Thus says the Lord, or did God really say? In the antithesis we can find in Genesis 3 already, I will put enmity between your Satan's seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So it's important to keep in mind that Christianity informs science. So in metaphysics we believe that there's more to reality than matter. There's matter and spirits, earth and heaven, the causation, the natural and supernatural causes, uh, epistemology, knowledge, senses, reason, divine revelation. We're going to have a different view on history, which we see as the unfolding of God's plan, a different view on the future, life after death, the second coming of Christ, and so on. Different views on purpose, ethics, and values. So a Christian view of knowledge will stress that God is the author of the physical world. God is the author also of the Bible. God upholds math and logic. But scientific theories, on the other hand, are on a second level. These are fallible human inventions that should agree then with observations, with logic, and what God has revealed through the Bible. Historically, it's important to remember that Christianity enabled science. So the cultural mandate in Genesis 1 provided motivation for man to study God's creation. Adam was told to subdue and replenish the world. So that means that he had to observe it and to use it. A belief in the rational God <coughs> who man imaged, made science feasible. If you look at the early scientists, you'll find that they were all <clears throat> devout Christians. Um, Francis Bacon, Johannes Kepler, uh, Galileo, and Newton. Uh, they all expressed that they were serving God. <clears throat> And that by studying nature, they were studying the, the, the work of the, of the creator God who made everything. Physicist Paul Davies, who's not a Christian, uh, has written, for 300 years science has based itself on materialism, leading inevitably to atheism and the meaninglessness of physical existence. But even the most atheistic scientist uh, accepts as an act of faith that the universe is not a bird, that there is a rational basis to physical existence. So science can proceed only if the scientist adopts an essentially theological worldview. So many scientists, uh, naturalists even, are granting that materialism has difficulties. Uh, Thomas Nagel is an atheist philosopher, but he's written a book recently called Mind and Cosmos, where he says that there's something wrong with Darwinism because it can't account for consciousness. So that we have to come up with something else, but he's not sure what it is. Uh, Leontwin has written, we take the side of materialism in spite of its absurdity of some of its contracts, constructs because we, ha we, because we have a prior commitment to materialism. So he says, well, I know it's silly that the same mind is an illusion, but if we don't do that, then we allow religion to take a foothold and we can't allow that to happen. So we have to be consistent in our materialism because otherwise we open the door to Christianity. Uh, John Searles has written the same thing. How come many, so many philosophers and scientists say so many things that seem obviously false, such as you don't have a mind or your mind is an illusion? Well, he too says if you don't, he says, the choice is between a scientific approach, materialism, and an anti-scientific approach, which brings you back to Christianity. Now, Nagel has written about what he calls the fear of religion. He says, I want atheism to be true. And I made it easy by the fact that some of the most intelligent, well-informed people I know are religious believers. 
But he says, it isn't just that I don't believe in God, it's that I hope that there is no God, I don't want there to be a God, I don't want the universe to be like that. Because if God exists, then he's going to hold Thomas Nigel accountable, and he wasn't, doesn't want that to happen. So he says, my guess is that this cosmic authority problem is responsible for much of the scientism of our time. Now, the whole notion as to whether God is dead comes from Nietzsche. He wrote, God is dead. We have killed him. Science has killed him. But then Nietzsche also wrote, science has killed truth. Because Nietzsche realized that, get back in the 1800s already, that if God is dead, then there is nothing to uphold absolute norms. And then anything goes. We don't have any morals. And we sink into despair. So reason starts to criticize religion. But after a while, it starts to criticize everything. It criticizes itself as well. And then human reason finds that it has uh, no proof for human reason. And it ends up destroying itself. Case in point is uh, Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell is a very interesting philosopher, British philosopher. He lived a long life. <clears throat> He's written some very readable works. Except his book, Why I'm Not a Christian, there he's really frothing at the mouth. But at the end of his life, he wrote, the center of me is always an eternally of terrible pain. A curious, wild pain, a searching for something beyond what the world contains, something transfigured and infinite. <coughs> Bertrand Russell had the misfortune of, he only had one daughter, he brought her up as best as he could to be an atheist, but to his horror, she turned out to be an evangelical Christian. <laughs> and he actually ended up um, sending his son-in-law to Bible school and paying for that for a year. But his daughter, Catherine Tate, has written a book called My Father Bertrand, which is very interesting reading because she writes how frustrating he was. He rejected God. But then he spent the rest of his life searching for truth, searching for something infinite, and he could never find it. And he just ended up with total frustration. It's like Augustine uh, wrote, uh, the soul finds no rest <coughs> until it finds its rest in God. Or Pascal put it maybe even better. He says, man has a God-shaped void that only God can fill. Pascal argued that God has created us in such a way that we need fellowship with God. That's, that's our natural inclination. And if we reject that, then we're still filled with the, the need. We have this hole. We still have this search for truth. But now, <coughs> pardon me, we can't, we can't find it, and we just end up being very frustrated. I'm going to end up here uh, summing up. Let me just sum up that uh, we've seen that there's no proof <coughs> that science can explain all or that all belief in God is irrational. We've seen that science is subjective. It needs a viable worldview. <coughs> that worldviews are based on presuppositions. That the defense of naturalism is self-refuting. Because if it's true, then... We have no human free will, <coughs> no thoughts, no truth, no rationality, no morality. There's no place for scientists, and thus no science. Christianity, on the other hand, gives coherence, meaning, purpose, and hope. And Christianity provides a solid basis for science. So to finish, uh, let me give you, leave you with a challenge. The first challenge would be to articulate your worldview. What are your most basic beliefs, values, and priorities? And then to work it out consistently. Because we have to remember that worldviews come as package deals, as all-encompassing systems. So mixing Christianity with another worldview introduces an inconsistency that will eventually undermine your Christian commitment. 
As Jesus said, uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, uh, which means that all of life then is going to be a struggle okay, to serve God. So we should strive then to make all of our thoughts captive to Christ. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. People would, who will tell you that there's no such thing as absolute truth. How do you refute that? Ask them, is what you said absolutely true? Refute. So anyway, we're going to take some more questions for John. I will bring the microphone around. For those that have a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. And while you're thinking of your question, I'm going to ask the three ushers to come forward. And for those that uh, would like to contribute to the cost of running this ministry, uh, you know, you're free to uh, contribute to that. So are there questions that people have that they'd like to ask? Questions? Don't tell me he snowed you. So how do you propose to make loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? How, how, how have you made that happen in your life? Well, that's a lifelong quest. Because although we're supposed to do that, uh, we all fall short. So we try to do that with, with prayer and Bible reading and doing those things that please the Lord. But in this lifetime, um, before Jesus Christ returns, um, even after we're saved, even though the Holy Spirit works in us as believers and uh, sanctifies us, it is a process that, uh, that we're going to keep falling short on. But I think it's something that we have to be active with. And therefore I would say that, that the two most important things would be prayer and Bible reading. Questions, anybody? I believe it was on Cam Ken Ham's site a day or two ago that scientists have now found that human beings are not actually able to be atheist. Um, that somehow scientifically we have to believe in God. Have you seen that and do you have any comment on it? I haven't seen that on Kenham's site. But I think that was, he was probably referring to some research that was done not that long ago where I think they, they tested young children to see whether they believed in God or not. And I think they found that belief in God, <coughs> pardon me, was, was natural for young children. So I think the conclusion of the test was that it seems to be something that, that young children are very much open towards, that, that God exists. And that it's only later in life that that's, that, that is taken away.
Um, what would you say to someone who doesn't, who, who believes that the Bible is not inerrant? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Um, there are some people who believe that the, uh, the Bible is completely inerrant and this because it's been written by man. Okay, how would I respond to somebody who believes the Bible has errors? <laughs> well, I would have to see what kind of proof they would have. But my, my position is that the Bible is the Word of God, so that the Bible would not have any errors in it. Uh, there are some places where people have said, well, there seem to be inconsistencies here or there, but I think those are all explic explicable. Uh, you know, there have been books written on that as well. So basically, I, I think that the Bible to be the inerrant word of God should be our starting point, because if you can't believe that all of the Bible is God's word. How can you believe that any of it is? Because once you start picking and choosing, uh, then you're putting yourself up and judge over Scripture as to what you think then it's going to be believable or not. That's why I think it's important as Christians that we start off with, with the premise that the Bible is the word of God. And also that when we read the Bible, we have to do it in objectively as way as possible. So the Reformers have insisted that when we read the Bible, we should read it in its natural sense, first of all, unless there's internal evidence that this is not the case. For example, the passage might be a parable or part of a vision. And secondly, uh, the principle was that Scripture should interpret Scripture so that we should read, <coughs> we should read the Bible in its, in its context and that the more clear passages should then uh, explain the less clear passages. But I believe it is essential that we believe that the Bible uh, is the Word of God, not that it contains the Word of God, uh, that it is fully authoritative that it doesn't have any errors because once you start playing around with that you end up with nothing left. When you're um, talking to physicists or people who use the tactic of circular reasoning to prove their theories or is there a way to witness to somebody to break that cycle of circular reasoning? Do you have a method that you can share? Well, <clears throat> when you talk to somebody, you would have to, you, you want to try to get behind what their presuppositions are or then show what the implications of that would be. So if you're talking about what they're doing or what their purpose are, then you can ask them, well, why would they believe that? So in apologetics, the first step would be to see, well, where, what is their worldview? Where, where are they coming from? What sort of assumptions are, are they making? Now, usually when you're talking to scientists, uh, you're talking about more theoretical things. Uh, once you start talking about, about values and ethics, then you're talking about things that go beyond the sciences. And most scientists are not philosophers. They're not ethicists. They're, they're very narrow specialists in their fields. So, so they're, they're very good in the technical aspect of, of their fields. But they're no more philosophers than a lot of other people would be. So a PhD doesn't really make you uh, a pearl of wisdom uh, beyond, beyond your own specialty. Yeah. 
Okay, we had a question over here. Um, how does, well, first I'll say um, we're fundamentally, uh, we believe in the six day literal creation, but with your slide presentation here, how does theistic evolution undermine Christian faith? Okay, theistic evolution undermines Christian faith. First of all, if you don't believe in six-day creation, you've got a problem. <clears throat> if you believe in an old earth, then you've got to deal with the fact that, that death, suffering occurred long before Adam and Eve. So then you're faced with the position that the fall didn't really change anything. That it just affected Adam and Eve. If you believe in evolution as well, and if you believe that man involved, and if you believe, <clears throat> see the standard picture with theistic evolution is, is that when humans evolved from apes, they did so as a group, okay, and that there never were two individuals but that this group always had a membership of at least about 10,000 or so. So that means that there would be no place for Adam and Eve, unless you want to see them as the, the chiefs, if you like, of, of a tribe as they evolved. So it undermines Christianity in, in that you can't take what Genesis 3 talks about now at face value, that the fall didn't really happen the way that, that it did, unless you take Adam and Eve as some kind of representative. Okay, but that becomes difficult to explain. Also, if you believe that man evolved, a further difficulty you have is that means that to survive, man had to be selfish. So our selfish nature is then seen as something that came about through evolution. It's something that, that God used to develop man. So in the traditional point of view, Adam and Eve were created upright, but through their own sin, they fell and they lost that. And then all of their offspring inherited that as original sin. But if you believe in evolution, then you don't believe in original sin anymore because you believe that, that God created man sinful to start with, so that man now is responsible for man, or God is responsible for man's sinful nature, not man himself. So the whole question of the atonement is now different as well. Uh, death is no longer seen as a penalty for sin because death, even human death, is something that God used throughout the evolutionary process. And if, if our sinful nature is something caused by Adam and something that we needed Jesus for to, to pay the price, that would make sense of, <clears throat> on the traditional point of view, but from an evolutionary point of view, there's no reason for Christ to die anymore. Then Jesus is just seen as an example. Now, the death of Jesus doesn't do anything for us. So a lot of people that are moving into theistic evolution believe also in universalism. They say that because God has made us sinful from the start, then he is responsible for us all, and through his mercy, then he will save us all. So there have been some essays written, but there's a Dan Harlow from Calvin College professor there. He wrote an essay on this a couple of years ago on Biologus, where he said, okay, if, if man evolved, yeah, we know that's the case now, then these are the implications that I see coming from this theologically. So he, then he says there's no original sin, uh, the atonement is gone, he believes in universalism, uh, man's sinful nature is something due to God. So there are very profound differences that you're going to have along the way, that if you accept theistic evolution, you're going to have to rethink pretty well all of orthodox uh, Christianity, certainly how man 
fell into sin and how he's going to be saved. Okay, uh, we could go on and on on that uh, topic for a while. It's a long topic to discuss. I think we'll, we'll bring that to a close now. And uh, let's thank John for his presentation and Q&A. Actually, I find it very ironic, or uh, John and I were discussing before this meeting, that it, it seems a shame that so many church leaders are turning towards, the uh, seminaries are turning towards theistic evolution when the scientific evidence against evolution is so strong. You know, the, the video that I showed there, those 15 scientists, you know, they've come to a conclusion Many of them used to be atheists. They used to be evolutionists. They've come to see when they look at the scientific facts, they don't support neo-Darwinism at all. You know, even evolutionists have seen that they don't have the answers. They don't have the answers to the origin of the universe. They don't have the answers to the origin of life. They don't have answers to the complexity of life, which is neo-Darwinianism. The answers are not there. Evolutionists see that, they understand they've got a problem, they just don't like the alternative. So anyway, that, that video is out on back there. We're going to, uh, next month, we're going to have uh, J.D. Mitchell, who's from Portland. He runs a creation group down there, and we've invited him to speak up here. You may wonder why you see so many petrified forests out there and polystrate fossils, which are fossils that go through multi, multiple layers of rock. How can that be? Those layers were down, laid down so slowly. How did they come to be? Well, J.D. Mitchell is the guy who's going to explain all that. So if you ever wondered about that, we have many examples of that in the Northwest here and uh, throughout the whole world. And he's going to show examples from all over the world of that and explain what that's all about. So you want to come back for that in... Uh, uh, three weeks time. Uh, the other thing, when we bring in speakers from outside of the greater Seattle area, we like to also um, make opportunities available to have them speak at your school, for example. You have a Christian school that could use a Christian speaker, or your church on the weekend may have a special program, or they're able to speak at you know, services, evening, morning services, Sunday school, what have you. And we're going to make that opportunity available. I'll, I'll make that um, known which speakers are available to do that as they come through. And there will be a few coming through in the next few months. Um, for those of you that want to take a flyer on the next meeting, there are some on the table back there. And if you want to you know, hang them up in your church, of course, ask the leadership of the church for permission to do that. Don't just hang it up. But uh, if your church leadership is okay with that, hang them up. Let other people know that we have these meetings coming up. So, and otherwise, keep up with the what's happening on the website. We're trying to keep that up to date with information on upcoming meetings and more information on apologetics. Uh, and there's some information in back for those that want to help out and volunteer for some of the tasks we have at hand within the forum. There's a sign-up sheet on the back table there. There's some business cards on the back table. If you want to take a card and give it to somebody, let them know about the form. That's also available back there. Okay, so let me close in a word of prayer, and then you can spend some time at the tables, and there's refreshment uh, by the kitchen there as well. Father, we just thank you for the time we've had here. Thank you for John Bile for his willingness to come here and share your word and share the information that he has learned and uh, is sharing now with others. And uh, we just pray that the word will, will go forth, that uh, people will use this information to talk to their friends, to give evidence of their faith to these friends who have these kinds of questions before them. And uh, we just thank you that you make this ministry possible. And bless the results, and just uh, give everybody safe travel back home. Uh, we thank this in Jesus' name. Amen.